Good morning, dear friends. If ever there's a word which has very little meaning in the life of an individual, in Dr. Wengert's case, it's the word retirement. <laughs> Dr. Wengert's so-called retirement has been an extraordinarily productive period in his life in terms of traveling, in terms of encountering people from various backgrounds from all over the world, in terms of his ecumenical engagement, and especially in terms of his publications. I won't take away from the introduction, the formal introduction that is to follow, but I do have one announcement. Augsburg Fortress has announced a series of six volumes, the annotated Luther series. Volume one, edited by Dr. Wengert, includes a fresh, accessible translation of the 95 Theses, among many other things, introductions, commentaries, annotations, illustrations. Dr. Wengert has kindly offered the first volume to any who are interested at a 30% discount. The volume, the volume you can look at, his personal copy is there at the back, and a leaflet, a flyer, which um, tells you what to do in order to get this precious volume. Let me now invite the president of our seminary, Dr. David Loos, who happens to know Dr. Wenger from the time he was a student right here, <laughs> to both welcome us and offer the opening prayer. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to the Lutheran Theological Seminary of Philadelphia for this convocation. Uh, and for our conversation that will happen here and continue. Um, I also don't want to take away from the formal introduction, um, but I will say just uh, one thing, that there are many things for which Timothy Wengert is known, including his scholarship and his churchmanship and his long and faithful service in so many different areas of our shared life of faith. But perhaps the thing he is best known for is the impact he has had on his students an impact that does not last simply the duration of the course or even one's seminary career, but throughout one's entire career. And as just brief testimony to that, I wanna recognize a classmate of mine, Glenn Foster, who drove four hours to listen to this and will have to leave immediately to drive four hours home. But that's the kind of impact that some teachers have on their students, that they equip us to think and to move in all kinds of directions, and yet we always feel that debt of gratitude. And I don't know if you know that as fully as we would wish, but Tim, I hope so. Now will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we give you thanks for your one holy Catholic and apostolic church. You have entrusted to it the mission of proclaiming the good news of the grace of your son, Jesus the Christ. You have called leaders through the centuries to guide this work. You have prompted those of zeal and conviction when necessary to reform it, and you have promised your Holy Spirit to guide it and all of us into all truth. Confident of your promises, we ask that you would give us grace seriously to lay to heart the great dangers we are in by our unhappy divisions, to take away all hatred and prejudice and whatever else might hinder us from godly union and concord. For there is but one body and one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. We pray that we may be all of one heart and one soul, united in one holy bond of truth and peace, faith and love, and may with one mind and one voice glorify you. Lord God, this church is yours, chosen and called by your design and set to your purposes. And so we make bold to ask that where it is corrupt, you would purify it, where it is an error, you would direct it. Where it is in anything amiss, you would reform it. 
Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. And where it is divided, reunite it, that we may bear fit testimony to you, to this world you love so much. All this we ask in the name of the one who died and rose again, who promised us peace and desired that we be one, Jesus Christ, the living Lord of all. Amen. Amen. One of the signs of Dr. Wengert's commitment to the worldwide Lutheran and other Protestant and, for that matter, Orthodox and Catholic churches all over the world is the ongoing interest that he takes in the lives of his students, especially promising students who pull him out of this so-called retirement <laughs> in order to continue as a primary advisor. And to introduce Dr. Wengert, I have Pastor Toshihiro Takamura, known as Topo, from the Japanese Evangelical Lutheran Church, a doctoral student at this seminary, a doctoral student of Dr. Wengert. Thank you very much, Dean. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Dr. Timothy Jin Wengert, my doctoral advisor. My name is Toshihiro Takamura, a pastor of the Japan Evangelical Lutheran Church and a doctoral student at seminary. I confess that I have toyed with an idea of someday introducing Dr. Wengert perhaps to my fellow Japanese Christians in a similar setting and in Japanese, but then I have never imagined an opportunity comes so soon. While I was visiting Japan this summer, I had a chance to speak with a colleague who had studied at the LTSP some 15 years ago. Among other things, he shared with me a memory somewhat related to Dr. Wengert. One of the tag words of Dr. Wengert at the seminary is, preach the damn gospel. <laughs> So at our online bookstore, though, you can still buy a T-shirt with this imperative. <laughs> T-shirt seems to have been around for the last two decades or so, and my colleague back then owned it and wore it when he was visiting South Carolina, the JLC's partner synod. Perhaps due to the insertion of the word "dam," especially as a modifier to the gospel, people there took it as being offensive and scandalous. <laughs> this story, however, captures the nature of the work to which Dr. Wengert has committed himself throughout his career as pastor and theologian. Bringing back our attention to the core message of Christianity, the gospel, and to the responsibility entrusted to ministers to preach it with utter clarity. Dr. Wengard had been Ministerium Pennsylvania Professor of Reformation History and Confessions at the seminary until his early retirement in December 2013. And after the retirement, he has continued to carry out the task of teaching and preaching the gospel in various ways as an emeritus professor. He has traveled extensively both domestically and internationally to serve as keynote speaker and a lecturer at conferences and workshops. He served a small congregation in New Jersey as a pastor. On top of overseeing and guiding my study here, he went to Wittenberg, Germany this past February and March and gave a series of lectures to Lutheran pastors from diverse nationalities as part of the Reformation 500 event sponsored by the LWF. He also spent a month in Germany this summer to work on his own research. Besides co-editing the Book of Concord with Dr. Robert Kolb, Dr. Wengard has written and edited a number of books and articles. In 2013, reading the Bible with Martin Luther became available. His most recent book publication is The Roots of Reform, 
the first volume of the annotated Lusa series, Fortress Press's sixth volume project, commemorating and celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. It is fitting to the theme to this convocation to remember his active involvement in ecumenism with the Roman Catholic Church and various Protestant denominations. Dr. Wengard had served the National Lutheran Roman Catholic Dialogue for uh, two, three years since 2012 as its member, and we deeply appreciate the service he and his colleagues have tirelessly offered to enable the dia dialogue to reach a number of significant documents, including this one, from conflict to communion. While I understand that she likes to be identified as professional grandfather to his two grandchildren, <laughs> it is appropriate to this occasion to introduce him as theologian and teacher of the church. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Timothy J. Wenger. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. It, it's really good to be back home, uh, uh, particularly after a month in Germany and then two weeks there and here and everywhere, uh, but also to such a, a welcome and uh, to such a promising uh, Reformation professor. I think one of the things that's the most fun about having a PhD program is you get to replace yourself. <laughs> <coughs> so. And it's very good to see, uh, uh, I, I almost said old faces, uh, t maybe I should say uh, lively faces uh, uh, here, both students and faculty alike. Um, uh, also, I, I should just mention that, that uh, Ingrid, uh, who is a pastor in uh, New Jersey, Ingrid Wengert, uh, my wife, is also here and uh, is going to be struggling with the, uh, with the uh, audiovisual stuff, because as all of my students know, I never use that <laughs> material, and it always goes wrong when I do. So. <clears throat> so, from conflict to convergence. In 1554, David Chitreus, a disciple of Philip Melanchthon and professor at the University of Rostock, first published his very popular catechism with a host of reprints coming in the following years. In it, Chitreus, one of the authors of the Formula of Concord, lists what he views as the three basic differences between Lutheran and Roman Catholic teaching on justification. One, the papists, he calls them, the papists teach a person merits forgiveness of sins and is righteous, not solely on account of Christ, by faith alone, but also by good works or their own virtues that match with the law of God, likewise by works of monasticism, masses, fasting, etc. Two, since no one knows whether he or she possesses enough good works they teach, it always must be doubted whether we have forgiveness of sins and whether we are in grace. And three, they teach that a person in this life can satisfy the law of God and by this fulfilling of the law can be righteous and merit eternal life. Fast forward to the 1970s. Professor John Ruman of this institution and a member of the still new Lutheran Roman Catholic Dialogue for the United States presented to the dialogue a book length discussion of the Bible's understanding of righteousness. It took several days of their meetings. His respondent, the equally well-respected New Testament scholar Thomas Fitzmaier, who contributed heavily to the Pauline section of the then revolutionary Jerome Commentary on the Bible, started his response with a two-sentence, with a two-word sentence that set the course for Lutheran Roman Catholic relations in the modern era. I agree. Although he followed that statement with nuances and expansions, even corrections that he thought necessary, nevertheless, that two-word answer reverberated throughout our two churches and the effects, of, the effects of which are still echoing today. 
This I agree rests upon two pillars. The first is obvious to any Roman Catholic who listens to David Kitreus' objections. Namely, we do not believe these things. That is to say, one of the first steps in true, honest ecumenical conversations is to discover your conversation partner's true beliefs. I think David Kitreus, one of the authors of the Formula of Concord, was right in that the three most important topics regarding the doctrine of justification, without which no agreement in doctrine is possible, are now in my words, one, Christ and faith exclude all works. Two, God's promise of forgiveness brings certainty, not selfish security or doubt. And three, no one can earn God's mercy. Yet a close reading of the decrees of the Council of Trent and of Vatican II reveal that what Catreus objected to is not what the Roman Catholic Church believes. The second pillar is simply the reverse of the first, namely to state one's own belief in relation to the partner's beliefs in such a way as to discover the true convergences that exist. That is to say, while ecumenical dialogue begins with listening, it always also involves accurate, honest speaking. To say, I agree, is not to be paternalistic, pat the partner on the head and say, nice job, finally you've abandoned your heresies for the truth. <laughs> Instead, true listening, the first pillar, always rests and results in true speaking and implies, always implies a kind of equality among the dialogue partners that did not heretofore exist. This is why in the decrees of the Second Vatican Council that opened the door to dialogue, the most important phrase was in calling other churches separated brothers and sisters and not sons and daughters. Now, already one could compare Catreus's list to Trent's decrees and discover that, with the exception of sola fide, by faith alone, the Roman Catholic bishops, meeting in solemn assembly at Trent, clearly removed works and merits from God's undeserved mercy in Christ. But further, when one compares Catreus's demands to the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, then the level of convergence is even more striking. To Amos Fitzmyers, I agree, was not simply an exegetical observation, but a clear exposition of his church's faith in light of Rumen's confession of the Lutheran and Pauline understanding of justification. It turns out, however, that the results of that auspicious beginning were not only the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, but many other important conversations and convergences that arose from both the US and the international dialogues. Indeed, we now live not only with the joint declaration, but also with, <clears throat> with a far more recent result of the international dialogue, namely from conflict to communion which was done by the international uh, dialogue, not by the national dialogue that I'm a part of. In any case, it outlines the convergences and remaining differences between our two communions, but I believe points a way forward in our continuing experience of God's gift of unity. This morning, I want to begin by looking again at the joint declaration before spending even more time examining from conflict to communion, all in an effort to invite you and your congregations and this seminary to commemorate 2017 not by dressing some poor teenager up in a bathrobe as Martin Luther with hammer and nails. <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> but rather by celebrating with Roman Catholic brothers and sisters in Christ our unity in the gospel. So first the joint declaration. In ecumenical relations, the journey towards visible unity begins with a single step. Usually, these are small baby steps. But in the case of the joint declaration, the step was enormous. In 1999, 
representatives of the world, uh, Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church met in Augsburg to sign together the joint declaration. It was the culmination of a journey begun in 1530 with the presentation of the Augsburg Confession, where the two sides were deeply divided, not just on justification, but on married priests receiving the sacrament and both using both bread and wine and the sacrifice of the mass. In 1541, 11 years later in Regensburg, Philip Melanchthon, Luther's colleague at Wittenberg, and John Eck, Luther's opponent already in 1519 at the Leipzig debates, came to fleeting agreement on justification, but faltered then on the question of the mass. 458 years later then, Lutherans and Roman Catholics overcame centuries of polemic and division to issue a joint statement on justification. What were the document's main achievements? Let me mention two. First of all, of the many things separating our churches, one of the main sticking points was the Lutheran phrase, faith alone. Unfortunately, to this day, I believe Lutherans suffer from what might be called catchphrase worship, in that they insist on holding to those words, faith alone, even though they may have given up what they stood for long ago. <laughs> that is, Lutherans can say faith uh, alone while interpreting faith itself as a human work done to earn God's favor and in the process become far worse supporters of works righteousness than any self-respecting Roman Catholic. Thus, when the phrase faith alone was missing from sections of the joint declaration that affirmed what both sides believed jointly, there was an uproar. In fact, however, already in the 1530s, Philip Melanchthon noticed that the point of the phrase faith alone was to summarize what he called the particuli exclusifi, the exclusive phrases in scripture, without works, without, apart from the law, and similar things. This definition, um, also preserved by two of his students, Kitreus and Martin Chemnitz, who were among the authors of the 1577 formula of Concord, helped make clear that Lutherans dare not reduce the phrase faith alone to a shibboleth but rather use it to summarize a host of exclusive phrases that are found in scripture. Thus, when, the joint declaration, when in the joint declaration the authors write, not because of any merit on our part, we Lutherans can hear the very phrases that we summarize with faith alone. Here's how the formula of Concord put it. This is the Apostle's Paul position when he so diligently and urge, urgently insists on particuli exclusifi, that is, on terms through which human works are excluded in the article on justification by faith. That is, Paul says, by grace, without merit, apart from the law, apart from works, not by works. These exclusive terms are all summarized when one says, by faith alone, we become righteous before God and are saved. For in this way, works are excluded. And therefore, there is, I believe, a, an agreement between Lutherans and Roman Catholics on the substance of faith alone, precisely using the kinds of definitions that have been around since the 1530s, but many Lutherans in the uh, 1990s and beyond seem to have forgotten. If this is the one important breakthrough in determining our convergence on justification, the other is a bit subtler, uh, namely that the Roman Catholic Church could enter into an agreement with the Luther Lutheran World Federation at all. That is, the very declaration took the very real differences in ecclesiology one step closer to convergence. When in 2000, the papal encyclical Dominus Jesus appeared with its consistent talk of separated children rather than brothers and sisters, Archbishop Wheatland of Milwaukee raised this very question. Let me clarify. If in Regensburg in 1541, the two sides could come together fleetingly on justification, what continued to divide the collocutors then and now is ecclesiology. 
by entering into an agreement with the Lutheran World Federation as a communion of churches, the Roman Catholics opened the door to a new and broader understanding of ecclesia that did not insist on being in communion with the Bishop of Rome as the sine qua non for public agreement in the gospel. Now, having mentioned these two very positive developments, there is one lacuna in the joint declaration that I want to mention. The document never defines carefully the meaning of the word grace. By this omission, it overlooks an important step in the historical development of Lutheran theology that took place between 1516 and 1521. In 1516, Erasmus of Rotterdam, the famous Greek scholar, issued the first edition of his Greek New Testament, placing the standard Latin translation, the Vulgate, next to the Greek. In 1519, he replaced the Vulgate with his own translation. But already in his annotations on that first edition, Erasmus noted that the Greek word charis should not be translated as gratia because of medieval scholastic claims that grace was a force or power that God infused into the hearts of human being to, beings to move them from a state of sin to a state of grace, and that bestowed a habit or disposition of love, habitus caritatis. Instead, Erasmus argued, the word should be translated as favor dei, the favor or mercy of God. While in his Galatians commentary 1519, Luther still objected to this exclusivity of Erasmus's claims, by 1520, Philip Melanchthon was arguing in favor of this change, and in 1521, apparently, won Luther over. So that almost without fail, Lutherans understand the word grace not as a force or power in the soul, but rather as God's unmerited mercy and favor, proclaimed to the sinner as forgiveness, life, and salvation. Nowhere in this document is the meaning of grace addressed which leads to a kind of confusion about its true nature. But we'll have to leave that for a later joint statement. Now let's look at from conflict to communion. If the joint declaration represented a breakthrough in relations of our two churches, the latest product of the international Lutheran Roman Catholic dialogue provides a road, road map for the future and an excellent way to commemorate the past. Let me refer to some of its more important aspects and encourage you to read it alone or in your congregations, in this seminary, and more importantly, most importantly, when you read it with Roman Catholics. Pope Francis has reminded us that this is the first opportunity Western Christians have to commemorate this anniversary together. I hope that Lutherans will take up that call and discover new ways to engage with their Roman Catholic brothers and sisters in serious conversations. There is no better way, I believe, than by using this document and the recently released study guide written by Lutheran and Roman Catholics in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, it's a much smaller thing and not quite as, as formidable as, as the uh, as the document itself. Both are uh, down uh, can be downloaded. Uh, off the off the internet, and they're also available for in in hardcover form. Uh, there is a uh, I've I've heard uh, 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 there there will be an uh, an American pub, uh, printing of this uh, from Erdmans, but that has not happened yet. So you can only get the English now in this form in 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 hard form from Germany, and it it costs uh, I think more money than my book in the back there. Well, <laughs> I read a lot, so. Now, chapters one and two are introductory, reminding the readers that this will be the first ecumenical commemorations of the Reformation in chapter one, and reminding also uh, them of the contributions of the newer research on the Middle Ages and the Reformation since World War II in chapter two. These important prolegomena need not be ignored, I think, uh, but I think that the most helpful material comes in chapters three and four, uh, which is where I want to concentrate my remarks. So first, uh, chapter three, how it all began. One helpful place to begin is indeed with the 95 Theses themselves, if for no other reason than to clear up some egregious misunderstandings about the origins of the Reformation. When I was a senior at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1977, Creighton Roman Catholic High School invited me to give a talk in one of their religion classes about Lutheranism. When it came time for questions and answers, a Baptist student 
I don't know what he was doing there, but he was there. A Baptist student raised his hand and asked, isn't it true that Luther started the Reformation in order to get married? <laughs> oh, sigh. <laughs> but there are even worse misconceptions on the Lutheran side. No better, uh, nowhere better demonstrated than in the image of an angry young man, hammer in hand, nailing a piece of paper to a wooden door. When I was in Wittenberg in March, I went to the top floor of the Luther House there, which has a standing exhibit of depictions of Luther over the ages. The first picture of Luther and the 95 Theses appeared in 1617 as a depiction of the legend of the dream of Elector Frederick the Wise, Luther's prince. There we see Luther, quill in hand, standing at the castle church door, writing on the door with a feather long enough to be knocking the papal tiara off the head of Leo X in Rome. <laughs> it's, it's in that book in the back. <laughs> Only in the 19th century do we finally find depictions now of a boy standing on a ladder posting the theses with Luther in front of him pointing back at them while addressing the people. I think the reason for that is that by the 19th century, no uh, self-respecting artist could imagine a German professor even knew how to use a hammer. <laughs> By mid-century do we get the first appearances of Luther with a hammer, first turned away from the viewers, but now in some recent images on Google facing the viewers as an angry young man ready to split rocks in pieces, or at least to split the church. So listen to some corrections by a church historian. If the theses were posted, it was with wax, not nails. The historical record, however, is not at all clear on whether Luther posted them or not. We have no direct evidence from Luther that he did. Well-respected Lutheran scholars debate both sides of that issue. And for those of you who get the Lutheran Quarterly, I know there's at least one, I think, in the room. Uh, at the end of this year, Volker Lepin, who's from Tübingen and I, are, are publishing a joint uh, article on the posting. Uh, uh, he's against it, and I'm in favor, and we're both Lutherans. What do you know? <laughs> what is far more important was that Luther posted them in the mail. For that, we have the cover letter addressed to Archbishop Albrecht of Mainz, dated the 31st of, of October, 1517. It is in an archive in Sweden. So we have no angry young man, no nails and hammer, but rather a deeply concerned theologian wishing to debate a burning pastoral issue of his day, the scope and meaning of indulgences and the way in which they were being preached. So let's begin by looking at page 25 that makes many of these points. This way, since I know this is a boring lecture, you can be reading and doing other things, you know, if you're not texting or, or playing online poker. Um, <laughs> paragraph 40 mentions the letter to Albrecht. Luther was not hearing wedding bells. He certainly had no intention whatsoever of splitting the church or even of reforming it. He thought later on of himself as a precursor to true reform, which Jesus Christ would, uh, would bring about himself. Paragraph 42 then, the phrase damaged Christian spirituality summarizes what I prefer to call Luther's pastoral concern. If we reduce the initial debate to academic hair splitting, which unfortunately some around Leo X did, then we risk sowing once again the seeds of division. Luther was concerned for bad preaching and what it did to people's faith. He was worried not that people were buying heaven, no one actually taught that, but rather that they thought they were buying their way around God's chastisement and discipline for sin. That is, to use a more modern term, Luther saw the problem as cheap grace, a monetary way of avoiding the divine punishment of the old creature and its sin, the remnants of which remained after baptism. Paragraph 44. Another important uh, sentence to emphasize is this. Luther was surprised. Heike Obermann, the doctoral advisor of my doctoral advisor, so your 
great-grandfather <laughs> wrote in his brilliant biography of Luther about longed-for reformations in the late Middle Ages in politics, in church, and family, and contrasted them to what he termed the unexpected reformation, which arose out of the 95 Theses. Indeed, everyone was surprised by what happened. The speed with which the Archbishop Albrecht sent the theses to his own faculty and to Rome, suspecting heresy. The vituperative first response by one of the chief promulgators of the Peter Indulgence, as it was called, Johann Tetzel. And perhaps most surprisingly at all, of all, the success, not of the 95 theses, which were never published in German translation and only saw three or four printings across the Holy Roman Empire, but rather of the German Sermon on Indulgences and Grace, Sermon von Ablass und Gnade, published in March 1518 and reprinted 20 times in the ensuing two years. By its publication, Martin Luther became the first living, best-selling author the world had ever seen. No one, but no one had ever so grabbed the attention of the listening public. We often associate Luther with the printing press, but the association was not planned, but accidental, unexpected. In other words, Luther created something that had not existed before in the church, an informed public, that is, people interested in reading or hearing what he had to say. Not only did no one anticipate this, no one, Luther included, had any idea what to do with what happened. The creation of public opinion in the church, heightened by the fact that Tetzel's refutation in German of Luther's sermon was never reprinted. That's the contrast. Another helpful paragraph comes in paragraph 52, page 28. The question of authority was already present in the 95 Theses but not as an attack on papal authority, but rather as an attempt to defend papal authority against its cultured despisers, to use a phrase that John Hofmeier would like. Of course, what Luther thought the pope would say was contradicted the next year by Leo X, who reaffirmed the church's teaching on indulgences. But it is important to note that the Sermon on Indulgences and Grace never mentioned papal authority at all but blamed the problem on certain scholastic teachers. Now, despite what this paragraph says, I would probably not hold that for Luther the authorities of scripture, fathers, and canon broke apart. Instead, what happened, I believe, is that he came to reevaluate how these authorities actually come together, how they relate to one another. It is not that Lutherans do not accord the creed, the church fathers and mothers, and even the canons of the church a certain authority, but they, they place that authority under the scripture as the primum et verum, as the first and true authority. Or in more customary language, scripture is the norma normans, the norming norm for all other authorities. But it doesn't mean we don't have other authorities. The issue separating Luther and his opponent at this point was not so much proper interpretations of scripture, but who the proper interpreters are and what the nature of such interpretation is. Here, Luther and Melanchthon, the chief uh, drafter of the Augsburg Confession, insisted that all interpreters are witnesses, like John the Baptist, pointing to the one who takes away the sin of the world. In any case, the document rightly points to the issue of authority as a growing issue in the early phases of Luther's disagreement with Rome. Incidentally, I think it's more accurate to say that Luther called the papacy, especially the curia in Rome, antichrist. As late as 1520, he could still speak quite respectfully of Leo X. The question then was the papal claim to have sole authority to interpret scripture, which Luther occasionally contrasted to the conciliar movement of the preceding century, which placed bishops in council above the authority of papal office. Nor was Luther's opposition to the Curialists and his calling them Antichrist based simply upon an appeal to the priesthood of all believers, as is stated here. As important as that understanding, now held in common with Vatican II, may be, Luther was not undermining authority of the pastoral office, despite the way some later Lutherans construed it, but rather distinguishing Christians' offices in the church from their standing before God. 
Well, moving on to paragraph 69. Paragraph 69 provides a description of the Augsburg Confession, the defining uh, confessional document of the Lutheran Church. Here, too, I'd offer a small correction. It was not the Augsburg Confession, but this is the way I would rephrase it. The Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who attempted to settle the religious conflict in the empire by calling a diet or parliament to meet in Augsburg, where the various estates were to present their confessions of faith. The evangelicals, led by Elector Prince of Saxony, John the Steadfast, responded, um, and that actually is a, is, a, is a slight reference to our president's uh, oldest son. Um, well, never mind. Uh, John the Steadfast responded with the Augsburg Confession. Why is this change important? It indicates that there were voices of moderation on both sides throughout the early phases of the dispute. Thus, paragraph 70 should add that princes and bishops on both sides resolved to maintain unity. As paragraph 71 explains, the Roman response affirmed certain articles of the Augsburg Confession. What is omitted is this wonderful little story about Charles V. Upon seeing the theologian's first attempt at refuting the Augsburg Confession, which simply condemned the entire document, he forced them to go back and to examine each article and to make a, a judgment on each article, we dare not forget the remarkable ecumenical spirit of this very Catholic emperor. This document in paragraph 79 now also presents a description of the intent of the Council of Trent, which is ex especially helpful for Lutherans. The decrees concentrated on areas of in dispute, quote, in a way that emphasized points of difference. This way of view viewing Trent has tremendous ecumenical potential in that one can then always ask if points of difference were not emphasized, how would the Roman Catholic Church express itself? And secondarily, do these points of difference accurately describe the actual positions held by Lutherans? That's the listening and speaking that I was talking about at the beginning. Part of the task surrounding the mutual lifting of condemnations focused precisely on these two things and becomes the engine driving much of the successful ecumenical engagement of the past 50 years. Another incredibly helpful statement comes in paragraph 90, where the relation between Trent and Vatican II councils is defined. It is an irony of history that one of the most divisive teachings of the 16th century, namely the continuing unfolding of true doctrine through the magisterium, allows for a later council to interpret an earlier one and not the other way around. As a Lutheran who occasionally gets to listen in on intra-Catholic conversations, I'm often surprised by how quickly some Catholics, at least, can seem to abandon this principle in a desire to hold on to another, often extreme interpretation of, of, in this case, Trent, despite clear statements of interpretation from Vatican II to the contrary. Uh, in any case, this paragraph is something of a primer in Roman Catholic ecumenical theology and needs proper emphasis, especially among Lutherans, who still operate with an outdated view of their Roman Catholic brothers and sisters and the dynamic nature of Roman Catholicism itself. Comments on chapter four now. These are themes in Luther's thought in light of our dialogues. Chapter four provides a roadmap for understanding the present status of our dialogue. In the remaining time allotted to me, I uh, would like to examine the central doctrines touched on here, uh, justification and Eucharist with some comments on ministry, scripture, and tradition and church. First comes justification. Luther's position arose out of the late medieval understanding of penance, paragraph 102, and the position of some theologians, notably Gabriel Beale, William of Ockham, that to, do, to, to those who do what is in them, God will not deny grace. The original intent of this phrase was to reassure people who were uncertain of whether God truly forgave them that as long as they tried hardest, God would promise to forgive. Luther, however, a convinced Augustinian, came to realize that when a sinner does anything apart from God's mercy, it's always tainted with sin. Trent will actually condemn Beale's late medieval position. Despite its popularity among a host of so-called evangelicalists today, 
summarized by the famous American statement, God helps them who help themselves. But this rejection left Luther with the same pastoral problem. How does one reassure the repentant sinner? His answer in paragraph 103 was to emphasize the certainty of God's promise. Where the text rightly says, a divine promise is directed towards a person's faith, I would just add, for Luther, God's promises are directed towards creating and strengthening a person's faith. Luther came to realize that a promise, when addressed directly to a person, uh, with that for you creates the very thing it demands, namely faith or trust in that promise. And furthermore, that such faith is not a work in that it does not finally earn or merit something from God, but rather is the response to God's promises. You can see this then much better reflected in paragraph 105, which states that trust is not a human decision, but rather the work of the Holy Spirit. A second aspect of justification is Christ alone. Paragraph 107. Not only does such a phrase eliminate human works done outside faith as a grounds for justification, it also makes Lutherans uh, resoundingly Christocentric. The danger here, of course, is a kind of Christomonism, to use the proper term for it, but with few exceptions, that's not what Lutherans mean. It's rather the equivalent of grace alone. When it comes to the law, I can really skip that material. It's very, very well put uh, on paragraphs 109 and following. Um, in any case, that only Christ fulfills the law, uh, love of God, uh, 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 the, or I'm sorry, only Christ fulfills the law, loves God above all else and neighbor as himself, and by that marriage of faith bestows that fulfillment upon us, daily raising up the new creature of faith in God's promises. These basic premises help clarify what Luther and later Lutherans meant when they said that the believer was simul justus et peccator, at the same time righteous a righteous one and a sinner. And this is spelled out in paragraph 117. To receive Christ's righteousness in this marriage of faith means precisely that we do not have a righteousness of our own as our own property. To be cleansed from sin means precisely that God takes what is our property, sin upon himself. To claim not to be a sinner is the one claim that cuts the sinner off from uh, Christ's gift of righteousness, 1 John 1, to say we have no sin. In the process, any righteousness of ours is not ours, so that every mouth is stopped, none can boast, and rather the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. This means that for Luther and other Lutherans, any good works of believers are only and always fruits of a good tree, that is, of a sinner declared righteous, and thereby participating in Christ's righteousness. Paragraphs 119 to 39, then, give a fine synopsis of the ways in which Lutherans and Roman Catholics have sought to hear one another's position in a new and, frankly, more charitable light than what we found by David Kitreus. The result, of course, was the joint declaration, further proof not only of the existence of God, but specifically of the existence of the Holy Spirit. The first comes in 119. Even in the 16th century, there was a significant convergence. Lutherans need to learn this, in part because they too have strayed from their own confession of faith and have been tempted time and again to turn salvation into a work that we must achieve. For this reason alone, a good dose of the joint declaration in Lutheran congregations would be a great help. Second, in paragraph 124, there's a quote from the joint declaration that recognizes the particular exclusive I have already discussed. Paragraph 137 again quotes the joint declaration. Catholics can share the concern of the reformers to ground faith in the objective reality of Christ's promise, to look away from one's own experience and to trust in Christ's forgiving word alone. I'd love to get Lutherans to agree to that too since in some ways we have worse problems with works righteousness today than anything Luther encountered in the 16th century. Moreover, as the so-called prosperity gospel and other forms of evangelicalism come to dominate world Christianity, we need to use our common commitment to the mercy of God to combat the rampant Pelagianism in our midst. Our failure to join forces, Lutheran and Roman Catholic, especially given this agreement, would be to our shame. On to the Eucharist. That Lutherans and Roman Catholics do not, except under certain circumstances, cannot share the Lord's Supper is and should be a continuing source of pain for us all. 
one that ought to drive us to more conversations. Our agreements here are profound, most notably that we both confessed the real presence of Christ in this meal. Since Vatican II, one of the other sticking points, namely communion in bread and wine, has been substantially removed. The communal nature of the supper, that we're bound together into the body of Christ, is also shared. The main sticking point comes with the question of the Eucharistic sacrifice addressed starting in paragraph 146. Luther and Melanchthon, while denying that the supper was an expiatory sacrifice, did insist that the unconditional promise of Christ at the heart of the supper, here am I for you, results in a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Thus the Mass is not a human work human beings do for God, but rather is a work God does for us. Our dialogues have come quite far in reaffirming the real presence of Christ uh, and so on. The, uh, the other, though, is that the, on the Roman Catholic side, Lutherans heard, perhaps for the first time, what really had always been Roman Catholic doctrine, namely that Christ's sacrifice on the cross truly was, this is paragraphs 157 to 59, by the way, uh, because I'm skipping things seeing how late the hour is, uh, uh, truly was, to use the words of the book of Hebrews, epapax, once for all. Indeed, what Lutherans had always held, namely that the supper contains and offers to communicants the effect of Christ's sacrifice, was shown also to be at the heart of the Roman Catholic teaching. The remembrance or anamnesis in the supper is precisely the Holy Spirit's work of catching the worshiping congregation up in the saving work of Christ. By decoupling sacrament and sacrifice in paragraph 159, the dialogues have made clear that the one saving event of Christ's life, death, and resurrection is not repeated or completed in the Mass, but rather that the one event is present in the Mass in a sacramental modality. What becomes the central sticking point in Eucharistic sharing, however, is our different understanding of ministry. We begin here with Luther's understanding of the common priesthood. This is page 61, paragraph 162 and following. Luther's understanding of this priesthood arose from our participation in Christ by faith, part of the joyous exchange of our sin for, uh, for Christ's priesthood and kingship. Um, in any case, as paragraph 163 makes clear, although all Christians share Christ's priesthood, they are not all ministers. Ministers are called to preach the gospel publicly in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, as Melanchthon will later say in the Apology, his defense of the Augsburg Confession. Now, I'll skip paragraphs 166 to 169 because I've written a book about this. And if you want to help an old retired person keep, you know, for his, his meager pension that he now has to live off of, and of course off the sweat of his frau, <laughs> that's for sure. There was an amen in the front here. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, I find that the, uh, the, the problem is how, how Lutherans have debated this, and it's in 166 to 169. It's a 150-year-old debate. Um, 169 is right on the mark. Frankly, those who support the notion that congregations delegate authority to the pastor have almost no historical leg to stand on, and I believe are more influenced by modern dreams of democracy than by Lutheran uh, universal understanding. But it's all in my book, you can read it. I should, however, let you know that although paragraph 170 states the generally held historical view of matters that Lutherans practice presbyteral ordination, I do not agree with that and believe that instead early Lutherans were much closer to Roman Catholic understanding about bishops than their descendants have come to imagine. Part of it has to do with understanding why they use the word superintendentes, superintendents, as the name for those who had oversight in congregations. Um, it is that St. Augustine, in his uh, sermon, one of his sermons on the Psalms, tried to translate episkopoi uh, which was not at all a, uh, a, a Latin word, but rather a, a Greek loan word, uh, and he translated it to, for his people as, you guessed it, superintendentes. These really are the bishops, and therefore it was not, an, an, a, 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 it was not a matter of practicing presbyteral ordination, rather but ordination by superintendents. The problem is simply that Rome cannot recognize them as bishops. 
But that's a different kind of problem than saying that, we, that anybody can ordain anybody, which somehow is a disease that is spread to the Midwest particularly. And the Lutherans out there, don't you know? So, uh, paragraphs 176, I have to skip some of this. Uh, paragraphs 176 to 86 then describe just how far Lutherans and Roman Catholics have come in their understanding of the ordained priesthood. Paragraph 185, in clear areas of disagreement, we nevertheless agree on the central point that, to quote, the church is apostolic on the basis of fidelity to the apostolic gospel. That really is a profound step in convergence. Moreover, paragraph 188 now, the question of apostolic succession has come to be defined not simply in terms of, quote, historically verifiable and uninterrupted chain of imposition of hands, but rather as a sign of, quote, being in communion with the whole order of bishops and its mission. Um, and now I want to get, uh, this is important enough to actually uh, read and not skip through. Uh, in paragraphs 187 uh, to 182, there are some of the most difficult areas in our conversation over ministry, but in 193 to 194, provide some considerations. The first on presbyteral ordination could, I think, be strengthened in view of some of the research that I've done in another book that you can also buy. The second is, uh, is profound and merits our deep consideration. From conflict to communion proposes here that we take seriously the ecclesial and ministerial consequences of the joint declaration, just like Archbishop Wheatland had, had, had guessed. Using Vatican II's assertion that the Holy Spirit uses ecclesial communities as a means of salvation, and given that the joint declaration is one of those instances of that very work of the Spirit, then, quote, this work of the Spirit would have implications for some mutual recognition of ministry. I could talk about uh, the questions of, of, of scripture and tradition, uh, which are also uh, here. Um, I will uh, skip ahead to uh, paragraph 204. And a quotation here, uh, well, uh, 201 I'll start with, sorry. Uh, what is remarkable about the research that has been done on the question of scripture is clear in paragraph 201, where Trent is understood as seeing scripture and non-written apostolic tradition in two, as two ways of handing on the gospel. When the gospel itself becomes the ultimate criterion, then Lutherans and Roman Catholics appear much closer than previously imagined. Add to that the line from Dei Verbum that's quoted in 204. Dei Verbum is one of the decrees of the Council, the Vatican II Council. Quote, that the church is not above the word of God, but stands at its service. And we have the possibility for meaningful convergence. Moreover, as Lutherans of the ELCA dare never forget, strides made in biblical interpretation over the past 200 years have lifted up the role of church, not only in handing on, but also in shaping the scriptural documents themselves. More I uh, will leave for your reading. Um, the role of tradition is dealt with in 107, and that would be just to repeat this idea that Lutherans understand um, uh, the, the witness of the fathers, the testimonia patrum, as Melanchthon states in the Augsburg Confession itself. We hold, um, because of the creeds, for example, a Trinitarian hermeneutic for scripture, something that er St. Irenaeus had already invoked in the regula fide against the Gnostic fundamentalists of his day. To put the example in modern language, if one takes seven random couplets from Shakespeare's sonnets to form a new one, the result is not Shakespeare, even though each individual line is indeed from the bard. Irenaeus uses Virgil as his example. The nuanced views of the relation of scripture and tradition held differently but in compatible ways by both our churches is one of the most important antidotes to a disease infecting Christians worldwide, a kind of individualistic fundamentalism that actually destroys the authority both of scripture and of tradition in an idolatry to self. A concluding remark. Uh, there is a section on the nature of the church we'll skip. As you can see, our two confessions have come a long way towards communion. We have perhaps a long way to go, but here we can best frame our conversation with a line from the Anglican hymn, For All the Saints. 
And when the strife is fierce, the warfare long, steals on the ear the distant triumph song. And hearts are brave again, and arms are strong. Alleluia. This booklet is a part of that song, From Conflict to Convergence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wengert. You were on the faculty of this seminary when certain doors opened, and one such door was the welcome that friends from the Roman Catholic Church felt was available to them right here in this seminary. And today we have one such person who walked through that door Sister Margaret Scott, who's doing her Doctor of Ministry studies with us. We would have loved to have a long time for questions and responses, but we believe that a representative of what you so eloquently described in terms of someone who embodies in her person and in her presence with us the fruits of the Roman Catholic Lutheran dialogue to make brief comments. And there's a Japan connection. Sister Margaret Scott served most recently as the school head of Saison International School in Tokyo. She's a member of the Congregation of the Handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In addition, She's adjunct faculty teaching the Eucharist, most especially at St. Joseph's University. Sister Margaret. Um, thank you very much. Um, I was going to say ladies and gentlemen, but I think it's friends. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, that was amazing. I am so moved and so touched. Um, I, in no way, am going to respond to Dr. Wenger. I couldn't do that. I'm not competent to do that. Um, really, I'm going to share with you where I came from and why I'm here in Lutheran Theological Seminary. Well, I have to warn you, I'm not the normal Roman Catholic. Um, I'm, I'm probably abnormal, but anyway. Um, I was born into um, an ecumenical mix-up. My father was in the Salvation Army, and my mother was a Methodist, and the rest of the family were Anglicans. So we had um, ecumenical dialogue right from the start. I was basically brought up on scripture, which is very un-Roman Catholic. <laughs> you know, when I became a Catholic later on, the Catholic didn't know what the Bible was, but I was brought up basically on scripture. Um, there is one memory that came to me as I was listening to you, my mother. My mother was an artist, an amazing woman, um, brave, prayerful woman. And I remember saying to her when I was a little girl, mommy, when I'm naughty, is God angry with me? And she said, darling, God is too busy loving you to be angry. So that's something I sort of grew up with. I became a Catholic at college. I went to London University, and I basically became a Catholic because of the Eucharist. I needed the real presence of Christ in my life. So that's why I became a Catholic. My first contact with Lutherans was when I was 17 years old. Um, I was going to go up to college, but I decided I didn't want to go now. It was a long time ago when there was no such thing as a gap year, but I decided to have a gap year. So I went to Germany to learn German, and I went to a place called Lippedetmuld, and I lived with a Lutheran pastor and his family for a year. And so I was there, I worshipped as a Lutheran, I sang in their choir, 
I learned Hebrew from Farah Nikrens, and that was my first experience. Um, I was there when they began building the Berlin Wall. That was a very powerful experience. Then I went to college, became a Catholic, but I am a post, post Vatican II Catholic, which I think makes a big difference. My experience of the Catholic Church is openness, the, the creon ecumenism, that we treasure the spiritual gifts of all world religions. This is what I was brought up with, and that's what I'd always lived in my own family and among my friends. I then lived in England for a while, and I was there when Dominus Jesus was written. I was involved in a lot of ecumenical dialogue, and the day before my next meeting with my ecumenical brethren, Dominus Jesus was published. I didn't know what to do. I thought, I'm not going. I can't go. How can I possibly go? So I slipped around the door and slid into the meeting. And they looked at me and said, hi. I said, I apologize. And they said, don't worry. It's just a blip. We will continue to pray together, work together, and be together as we always have. I also was invited in 2003 to the first Kirchentag that was the joint ecumenical Kirchentag in Berlin. That was a very powerful experience. It was jointly organized by the Catholics and by the Lutherans in Germany. Very, very powerful. So I've had my experience of living with praying with, working with Lutherans and other denominations most of my life. I then came here to the United States and I was running a retreat house as well as teaching in St. Joe's in Haverford. And lo and behold, um, a Lutheran woman called Claire Burkhardt <laughs> spent quite a lot of time with us. And then she became Bishop Claire. And also some of your people used to come to us for retreats. I wanted to do a doctorate, but full-time in the retreat house, full-time in St. Joe's, what was I going to do? So a Jesuit, a Roman Catholic, Father Dan Joyce said, why don't you go to the Lutheran Theological Seminary? They have a fantastic course for people in full-time ministry. I came, I met with Dr. Grafton, who is my, um, my, my tutor, and that's how it began here in Lutheran Theological Seminary. It was a perfect fit. First of all, I was very full-time in ministry. And secondly, it was a Lutheran seminary. I felt, for me, it was a sacred place. It was known. It was comfortable. It's what I had been experiencing all my life. And so I began. In our courses, there were Lutherans, myself, another Catholic from time to time, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, one Mormon turned up, and it was a meeting of hearts and minds. Amazing. I have learned so much from our lecturers, from my fellow students, and it has all been communion. It's all been dialogue. And then I went off to Japan for three years, but I thought that is the end of the Lutheran Theological Seminary. Not at all, said Dr. Grafton. You know, online. So I continued from Japan, did two courses online, fantastic, and the blog, the shared blogs also, were so important for the sharing. But also, um, we had a lot of Germans in school. In Sesen International School, we have students from 60 different countries, have a lot of Germans. And so I used to go to the German Lutheran Church in Tokyo to get my Advent wreath every year at the Weihnachtsfest. <laughs> and now I'm back, thrilled to be back, beginning my thesis. But really, I feel it's a coming home. It's a coming home. I missed Lutheran Theological when I was away, but I'm back home now. Basically, we are all followers of Jesus Christ. We have so much in common, and we're walking together, getting closer and closer. And it's just so exciting for me to be back here in Lutheran. 
So thank you for everything. It's all dialogue, it's all communion, it's all gospel. Let's thank Dr. Wengert, Sister Margaret, all of you. This has truly been a blessed occasion. Thank you very much. <laughs>